Newton's so-called Newton's gravitational constant is not constant. It varies in space and time. It's a function of space and time. And this plays an important role in the theory. <coughs> so, uh, I will now begin to show you how this theory works. And uh, I've been collaborating with my graduate student, who is now Dr. Brownstein, as of this summer, and uh, with Victor Toth, who is a physicist in Ottawa, whom I'm collaborating with, we have been collaborating with for the last year or two. So this is what Mark must also has to explain. This, the cosmic microwave data, background data, including the power spectrum data. I had to throw some buzzwords at you. I can't avoid doing that. This is physics. The formation of galaxies in the early universe and the growth of galaxies. Gravitational lensing data for galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Gravity acts like a lens. So when you have light coming from some distant source, and it passes near another source, a body, and the body, the second body acts as a lens, gravitational lens. The bullet cluster, these are colliding clusters that are observed out there in the universe. We had to do n-body simulations of galaxy surveys. So there's a large number of galaxies, and you have to do computer calculations where these galaxies are treated, each treated as a body, and you have n of them, and this makes up the structure of a galaxy when you do these computer calculations. <coughs> Finally, you have to explain the accelerating expansion of the universe. Or maybe not, as we'll find out. Because maybe the universe is not accelerating. This is just a confusion. Okay. Sorry, this is the way it is. So, uh, uh, when Einstein published his theory, in 1916, there was a brilliant idea to say that matter warps space-time, that matter actually deforms the geometry of space-time around a body with matter. And this is what gravity is. It's not a force. This is a brilliant idea. However, he had it easy, if I may say so, because he had three predictions. One was the uh, orbit of Mercury, which is the planet closest to the Sun. It has a Rosetta shape, and uh, it's, it's an open orbit. <coughs> and he correctly predicted the, what's called the anomalous precession of Mercury, which was discovered by the French uh, astronomer and mathematician Le Verrier, Joseph Le Verrier. Then he had uh, the red gravitational redshift of light from, say, the surface of the Sun, which was not confirmed at all, and the bending of light by the Sun. And this wasn't confirmed or understood, uh, observed until 1919. Even then, the data in 1919 was not very good. But he had uh, Sir Arthur Eddington as his media person, and Eddington made him famous, okay? Things are not so easy today. I haven't found my editor yet, but I'm looking for it. So, uh, today, when you construct a gravity theory, it's horrendously complicated because you have a huge amount of data to fit. And for me, I have to fit all of this data from the solar system out to the edge of the universe, the observable edge of the universe, with my gravity theory without dark matter. And once I fail, and I cut doesn't work, I have to start with you, uh, including a lot of dark matter, I quit. Uh, I have a piece of paper signed privately. Once this happens, I quit. So it means that dark matter either exists, really, or I have the wrong theory. So this is the one piece of mathematics you see. This is called the um, action principle, the action. And this is the underlying master equation of the whole theory. Once you start with this action, then 
you do what's called the Weirschner Principle, first uh, invented by the French mathematician Maupertuis, and uh, elaborated by uh, people like Lagrange and uh, Hamilton. And uh, this gives you the field equations. And once you have the field equations, you solve them, and you're supposed to get predictions that agree with all the experiments. That's the story. Okay, so the first thing I did was to see if I could fit the galaxy data. So, it's best if you publish your theory and then sit around and wait for someone else to do all this work. <laughs> and this is not going to happen. So, to do all this I had to learn a lot of astronomy beyond what I knew already, and uh, a lot of cosmology. And I did it with my graduate student to start with, John Pernstein. So, we published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal, peer review journal, and uh, we fitted over 100 galaxies. These are the rotation curves of galaxies. This, that is, the velocities of galaxies as they rotate inside the galaxy in circular orbits. And it works, okay? So it turns out that, that in Mog, when you go from the center of the galaxy out, the gravity force or the geometry, or the, the, the strength of gravity increases. And it speeds up the stars that go around inside the galaxy. And then the strength of gravity decreases again outside the galaxy and you get back Newtonian and, and uh, Einstein gravity and what's called Kepler's laws. So hence Kepler, the, the, uh, uh, the famous astronomer, mathematician <coughs> from the 18th century. So, uh, these are some details which I don't want to go into, particularly if the Tully Fisher law has to be satisfied. And uh, so let's get to uh, some some results. These are uh, what I call gold-plated galaxy observations. Uh, NGC 2403, NGC 4157. This curve is my prediction. This is the data. This is the um, stellar mass, and this is the the green curve is the uh, hydrogen and helium gas. <laughs> And we can get this data from, from uh, observations. And this is, if you use Newton and Einstein, this is what you get for the velocity of the uh, versus distance uh, predicted by Newton and Einstein. And this is what Mark gives. Again, there are two more systems. And you notice here there's a kink in the velocity curve. And if you look down there, there's a kink in the gas curve, the gas data. And this kink fits that kink. And what this is saying is that, <coughs> that, um, that the velocity, the light follows the matter. The, the matter follow, traces the light, light given by observations. And you cannot get this kind of detail from the dark matter picture. It doesn't work for dark matter because the dark matter particles are collisionless. So they can't produce this kind of detail. So already we are beginning to see that there's a problem with dark matter as a model. <coughs> In uh, August 2006, um, a group of astronomers at uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, California, uh, published uh, uh, observations for the uh, collision or merging of two clusters. It's called the Buddha cluster because you have a small cluster of galaxies. These are clusters of galaxies now. And a larger cluster of galaxies. And NASA produced a press release in August 2006 saying that this result definitely proved the existence of dark matter. And I thought, hmm.